Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today we are delighted to have uh, Dr. Lina Gheorghe from Columbia University and uh, she's going to talk about the stability of the charged black hole. Uh, please take over, Lina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oscar, for the invitation and the presentation. And uh, I'm very happy to be, you know, virtually at, uh, at Harvard, back at Harvard. And yeah, today I want to talk about the stability of charged black holes. And so let me start right away. What's the best way, you know, to start a talk, uh, if not with uh, an equation? And so let me start with just by writing down like, you know, the main equation that um, I'm really talking about, which is the Einstein equation. That, of course, is the main equation of general relativity, which I, I, I assume most of you are familiar with. But just to set, set up the notation, um, the Einstein equation is, is, the, is uh, the, the equation that involves you know, the, the metric, the four dimensional Lorentzian metric um, uh, of a over dimensional manifold that satisfies into the following relation. So some, the Ricci curvature and minus one half Ricci scalars times the metric is equal to T mu nu, where T mu nu is the stress energy tensor of the matter fields involved. So here I'm considering just the cosmological constant to be zero. And uh, of course here Ricci curvature and, and Ricci scalars are combinations of curvatures of this metric. And uh, what, um, what you can, uh, uh, look what you can deduce from this uh, equation is really that uh, the unknown, which is the metric, uh, it, which is encoded in this in these uh, curvature operators, which are of course like second order uh, derivatives of the metric, then those um, those uh, curvatures should be sourced by this T that somehow is supposed to contain all the information about the matter fields present in. Uh, in, in the universe or in your, in your theory, in your model. So of course, this is in general a very uh, complicated equation. It's a, a you know, second order partial system or second order partial differential equations with, with, a, with a source given by T. And so as a first approximation, of course, one can assume that there are no matter fields. So T is identical in zero. And then the Einstein equation reduces to the Einstein vacuum equation by taking the trace on the left-hand side. You can see this reduces to the Ricci curvature equal to zero. And you may have, Heard or you know or not, but you may have heard like a sentence such as "vacuum case already contains all the difficulties," or um, that in a certain sense, the study the Einstein vacuum equation is uh, sufficient to understand uh, uh, the the more the more general case when where t is not necessarily identical to zero. In a certain sense, this is this is true, especially if you're thinking about the geometry of the space-time. There's not so much that necessarily changes when considering different t, but the analysis instead of the resulting equation, so the equation that you that you get out of this Einstein equation, well, this is actually simplified, like much simplified in the vacuum case, and the the analysis instead it's it's different where the gravitational radiation is sourced by other radiation, in fact, interacts with other matter fields. And that's what I want to talk about today. In particular, the first uh, matter fields that we can consider is, that, is if we assume that the gravitational field can interact with electromagnetic radiation. So if we want to literally add some color to the equation, then uh, we would, uh, for example, consider the Einstein-Maxwell equation, which is, which is the following um, now equation, so the Ricci curvature is now sourced by a quadratic expression into an F, where F is a two-form, that is called the electromagnetic tensor that satisfies itself the Maxwell equations here. So F is a, is a closed form, was the word, which is divergence-free. And of course, in looking at the Einstein Maxwell equation, so we added colors to the equation and we had this right hand side. But of course, in adding colors, we also added difficulties. And so uh, I first want to spend just a few minutes to motivate why you may want to add these difficulties, and not just for the sake of having no more difficulties, but, just, but because it may be uh, useful um, in, in, in a certain sense. And so why? Why really should we study a non-vacuum uh, solution? Of course, there are many motivations one can have. You know, from a physical perspective, if you think about you know, the detection of gravitational waves emitted by a black holes merger uh, as detected by LIGO in 2000, for the first time in 2015, there is a very uh, a strong motivation, at least for me, coming from a similar detection, the one that for example, for the first time happened in August 2017, when LIGO observed the first merger of two neutron stars. And what happened is that just two seconds after the, the gravitational wave signal was detected by LIGO in, you know, on, in, uh, on, on Earth, 
A flash of gamma rays was detected by the Fermi satellite on space, and they, these two signals were coming from the same uh, corner of cosmos. And so this really started, uh, let's say, started a new field of gravitational astronomy. It's called the multi messenger astronomy, where uh, now we expect to have events that can be observed through different two different signals, one in gravitational waves and one in electromagnetic rays. So this, so you see, there is electromagnetic um, field in the picture, and there are some studies, some in the medical simulations that suggest that the merger of two neutral stars is in fact expected to collapse into a rotating and charged black hole. Here you can see this uh, the, this image from uh, uh, some um, so some uh, no, uh, physicists and medical relativists. Uh, one, one is Elias Moss, who was a, a colleague of mine at the Princeton Gravity Initiative, where you can see that uh, you can see that if you consider like a magnetic field around uh, uh, um, a, a spherically symmetric uh, neutral star, then the magnetic field will uh, the, the expectation is the magnetic field will disperse very fast, and so after the collapse, so like you, you won't have any any charge or any magnetic field left. But if you're in the rotating case, so if if you're if, if there's an neutral star that's rotating, then the magnetic field will create will induce an electric charge in uh, uh, in the picture. And now, even though the magnetic field will disperse very quickly, the electric charge will remain at the end of the day. And so this is this is uh, what, why we they expect this collapse to go to occur Newman black hole to a sort of rotating and charged black hole. And even without going to neutral stars, just the merger of the merger of two black holes. Could actually be charged. So there have been recently uh, some some works that suggest that uh, comparing the waveforms uh, of the first observation, the one in 2015, which is still the strongest, uh, the strongest observation LIGO did, um, these these waveforms are actually, uh, as you can see here, are compatible with having charge to mass ratio as high as 0.3 in in the in the black hole that in the two black holes that merged. So in a certain sense, the black hole is the the, the this. Um, the charge is not necessarily negligible. So I hope now I give you some motivation why we should, you know, we should look at the case of the Einstein-Maxwell equation. And now I'm going to review very, you know, very quickly what is the family of black hole solutions to the Einstein equation. Of course, you know, the first solution you want to, uh, you want to write down is the Minkowski space-time, the equivalent of linear space for the Einstein equation is the empty space-time. Um, a little bit, you know, more interesting, um, we have the, the uh, explicit black hole solutions to the Einstein vacuum equation, which of course are the Schwarzschild space time, uh, one parameter family depending on a mass m, and written here in you know, this uh, TR uh, theta phi coordinates, and uh, the Kerr space time, which uh, now two parameter uh, a is a rotation parameter, m is the mass, and if a is equal to zero, this reduces to Schwarzschild. In general, it's this uh, metric that uh, you know, it's a uh, a uh, bit more complicated, but uh, again, it represents a stationary ro rotating black hole. And this, in a certain sense, are the only explicit black hole solutions because of the no hair theorem, but uh, I'm not going to say too much uh, about that. And of course, so these are Schwarzschild and Kerr solutions to the Einstein vacuum equations. Uh, and there are the two cousins uh, of, of Schwarzschild and Kerr uh, for the solutions to the Einstein Maxwell equations are Rice and Nordstrom space time. Which is again spherically symmetric here, uh, but now has two parameters q and m. And so you see the factor of Schwarzschild is modified uh, with, by this uh, the presence of this term q square over r square. And now q can be interpreted as the charge of the black hole. And the cousin of Kerr is called Kerr Newman space time. Now has three parameters: so the mass, the rotation, and the charge. Has the same expression as as the Kerr metric, but now the delta also contains contains both the Kerr and the resonance part. And so this can be Newman space time is really the most general black hole solution that is, you know, it, it contains all the other cases, all the cases of Schwarzschild, Kerr, and resonance. And uh, of course, this is, uh, uh, these are uh, extremely important solutions because, you know, they, it's very important to have uh, explicit solutions because you can do lots of things, you can compute, uh, you know, geodesics, compute curvature invariance, and reduce lots of lots of things out of an explicit solution. But of course, if you think about in terms of 
let's say, this detection of, of, of LIGO now trying to understand, to understand what happened in the merger of two black holes, then these solutions are really not good enough to describe what happened there because the, as, you, as you can see here, the, the, they, their, their metric does not depend on time. So that's the way we call, call the solution stationary, right? Um, but so, the, so uh, if they do not depend on time, it really means that they're sitting there and being being uh, um, equal to themselves forever, just sitting still. So those are not good enough to describe the dynamics of black holes. And to, to do that, we actually have to uh, change the you know, the uh, mindset and actually thinking uh, in terms of thinking of the Einstein equation as as an initial value problem. And thankfully, I mean uh, we can do that by you through Shokebura's theorem. Uh, that says that you know the Einstein equation in a specific set of coordinates called wave coordinates is a hyperbolic system of PD of the form like the version of the metric G applied to the metric G is equal to some nonlinearities in the metric and its first derivative with some initial data that have to satisfy you know, the constraint equations and so on. But without even going too much into the detail, what this really is telling me is that if you if I have some uh, initial data that are not compatible uh, for the Einstein equations to so some initial metric and initial time derivative of the metric, which is a, like a second fundamental form on a certain initial time slice, then using this hyperbolic system of PDE, I can solve uh, locally for the Einstein vacuum or Einstein Maxwell equations uh, in time. And so this implies uh, for, for some short period of time. So this really implies local web closeness and continuous dependence on the initial data. But of course, this doesn't really, so this theorem per se doesn't really tell me about the long time behavior of whatever initial data I have here. So I can only, I know I can only solve for some short period of time. And so instead it's the stability problem for the black hole solutions is really concerns really the long time behavior. So he's asking what, what happens after a long time, not just this, this small time of existence given by the Gross theorem, but what happens after a long time to some solutions to the Einstein equations, which for example, are perturbations of non-solutions. So those non-explicit solutions that I told you about, Schwarzschild, Ferris, and Norton, and Gernieuman, what happens if I perturb the, those, those initial data? What happens after a long time? And here is the uh, conjecture that I'm going to just, you know, to call the stability of the Kernuman conjecture. It says that those initial data, so initial data for the Einstein equation, which are sufficiently close to a Kernuman black hole, they evolve asymptotically in time to another member of the Kernuman family. Okay, so this is, so from, from, from a PDE language, that's just to, to repeat and make, make things uh, more clear. If I uh, represent the Einstein equation by a nonlinear operator P of phi equal to zero, and then, and then and I know that there is a family of stationary solutions, so let's call it phi lambda, parameterized by a certain parameter lambda. So I know it's a Kernuman, the Kernuman solution, for example. So the lambda will be the mass, the rotation, and the and charge. Uh, those are those are a family of solutions. So if you plug in the operator, this give you is equal to zero. And then the uh, the, the problem of, of stability, of proving proving that this this equation is stable, like this family of solution is stable. Uh, under small perturbations really means that I want to prove that a solution with some initial data close to a given phi lambda then converges asymptotically in time to a certain phi lambda prime with lambda prime close to lambda. So I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that the, the, this, the perturbation of phi lambda should converge back necessarily to the same phi lambda. So this would mean that the just one solution phi lambda, so one can one black hole is stable, and that's not what, what this conjecture is saying. It's really what, what this conjecture is saying is that the family of Kernelman solutions is stable. So it's the, the whole family of phi lambda to be stable. So if I start to be close to a phi lambda, I may converge to some phi lambda prime with a different lambda prime, which is close to a lambda, but it will still be something of the form phi lambda prime. So it will this still be something of that belongs to the family of stationary solutions. So that's what the uh, being stable, uh, the problem of stability really means. And of course, there are many different level of difficulties one can, can treat this problem. So the first thing you can, for example, linearize the equation. So think of taking some sort of derivative of this, of this uh, operator here and you know, evaluate it at your solution. Now, this is a linear operator. So, so uh, you can now look at this linear operator, and uh, again, you can have 
two different level of difficulties in, in doing that. You can look at only separated solutions. So since the all, all our family or all our solutions are uh, symmetric with respect to the variable T and phi, so they're uh, stationary and axially symmetric, you can, we can, you can look at only solutions of the form where you factorize out you know, this symmetry of T and phi and only have some dependence in and theta. And you can show that those separated solutions do not, do not exponentially go in time. And that's what it's called the mode stability. Or you can prove that all solutions to the linearized equations decay in time. And that's what I call the full linear stability. And of course, uh, if you don't want to linearize, if you want to prove you know, the actual thing, which is that solutions to the full nonlinear operator decay in time, then this is what is called the full nonlinear stability. Okay, so this is uh, just a, a picture of uh, the kind of uh, problem that we're talking about. And in general, these are very difficult problems, like this long time behaviors uh, uh, analysis of uh, hyperbolic PDEs. And one may really uh, wonder why even, uh, why would one would even believe that such conjecture is true? Why? Because it, it's, it's, it's quite, it's quite, uh, uh, crazy if you think about it that you know I uh, think that you know anything that is that is close to the Kernuman family has to be the Kernuman black hole has to be of the form so that converges asymptotically back to a member of the Kernuman family. Why do people believe that this conjecture is true? Well there are some clues that have been you know piling up in the past you know 50 years uh, to for, for this conjecture to, to believe to be true. So the first the first is the mode stability or the mode stability results. So that in fact most stability holds true that there are no exponentially growing modes for separated solutions of the Einstein equation in Schwarzschild as Nostrum and K. Not in Kern Newman, and I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to get, come back to this uh, at the end of the talk. But uh, see, these have been many works, you know, by G. Wheeler, Zerilli, Von Krivchen, Dosekar, Tukowski, that you know, end up with the proof of Whiting of you know, the mode stability um, uh, in her. And so these were done in, in the 70s and 80s. Um, and you know this this gives a, like a very strong uh, clue about what happens at the level of separated solutions of the linearized equation. Then, if we really want to we want to look at the linearized or the, the full complete linearized equation, then we also have some clues to the stability because we know, for the, especially for works in the past ten years, um, that general solutions to the wave equation arising from some regular initial data they remain bounded in decaying time in all these solutions: Schwarzschild, Nonstrom, Kern, and Kernuman. And so this has been a long series, no series of works by many people. Let's say it culminated with the work of the Bernard Solinaski, Schwab, and Rothman, really showing that this the wave equation is uh, stable in the full sub extremal range of curve. So this is for the linear part. So we have this clue that the linear part may be stable. Now, what about the nonlinear part? Well, the clue that we have for that is the work of Christopher Lukanema in the 90s, the proof, the proof of the nonlinear stability of Minkowski space. The solutions to the fully nonlinear einstein barton equation, which are perturbation of Minkowski, will give rise to a complete space time which converges back to Minkowski space. And so somehow we have the, the, the understanding that the nonlinearities of the Einstein equation behave good enough, behave you know, well enough that we can handle them. So this is why there is all these clues that make people believe that you know this conjecture uh, is true. And then after you know, all these clues, there have actually, actually been many uh, results. Uh, uh, in, for the stabilities of the Einstein equation. So first in the Schwarzschild space time has in fact been proved to be linearly stable. Uh, in the first uh, two gravitational perturbations, the first work was by the famous Olsen in 2016, and other proofs have followed. And there are also now proof of, for the nonlinear stability uh, by Kahneman Schiftelli under the, uh, the symmetry class of axial symmetric polarized perturbations. And in the full um, um, pictures so of two co dimension three, some, man some manifold that uh, is, is just needed to. In order to uh, uh, to have Schwarzschild embedded in the curve space in, in the curve family of solutions by the famous also Yaronyaski Taylor just a few months ago. Now the curve metric has also uh, proved to be uh, linearly stable. So there have been works for the uh, uh, boundless and solutions to the Tukowski equation 
for small angular momentum that we're not also going to ask it's in the full subextremal range recently, much love it about Mate Shira da Costa. It also works about the perturbation, I mean, the, the, the control of the metric uh, coefficients by Anderson, Batal, Bluma using human Pernos formalism, by Afner and Sabaj using harmonic gauge. And for the um, and there's also like, some ongoing work with you know, partially partially out and uh, partially uh, upcoming uh, for the nonlinear stability of uh, the metric for small angular momentum of Kainama Sheftel and Kainama Sheftel and myself. And it, in the case of the Einstein Maxwell equation, uh, the, the rise and Nordstrom metric has proved to be linearly stable to the couple perturbation and magnetic gravitational as a, a series of results that started with my thesis and after that, um, and where uh, I proved this linear stability that holds in the full sub extremal range for Q less than M. And now that I, I have some recent works about the uh, boundedness and decay for solution to the Tukoski system in Kerr-Newman for small angular momentum that goes towards the proof of the linear stability of Kerr-Newman. And just to give you an idea of how a theorem uh, such, such as this, uh, uh, such as this ones I talked about, uh, look like, uh, here, is, here is how, is how they look like. So, uh, for example, the, for the linear stability of Rice and Nordstrom, uh, what the theorem says is that all solutions to the linearized Einstein Maxwell equations around the Rice and Nordstrom space time arising from some regular initial data, they remain uniformly bounded on the exterior and they decay into a linearized Kerr-Newman solution after adding a pure gauge solution, which can itself be estimated by initial data. So you see here, if you if you have in this you know in this picture, if I represent all the family, the family of, of solutions, so this is A over M, this is Q over M, then if I start with this uh, with the Rice Nordstrom solution, so somewhere where A is equal to zero here, then what the what what I have to accept, as I said before, is that if I perturb a black hole, this may change its this perturbation may change its mass, rotation, and angular. So in particular, a rise to Nordstrom black hole may well, very well become a Kerr-Newman black hole with a small angular momentum. And that's what this theorem says at the, the level of the linearized equation. So that this, um, this um, the, the perturbation will decay to a linearized Kerr-Newman solution. So they will be somewhere in this, in this circle here. And, and of course, this has to be done after adding a pure gauge. Uh, I also have to accept that, that uh, uh, the Einstein equation is a tensorial equation. So any decay can only be proved up to a, a definition and uh, choosing a gauge solution, which can itself be estimated by initial data. So this is how uh, the theorem about stability of a black hole look, looks like. And I want to give you an idea of how one can prove such a theorem. Well, how do we study you know, really the Einstein equation in practice? Well, alternatively to Shokyo Bras approaching with coordinates, we can actually use the fact that instead of using coordinates, we can actually use frames. So, which means vector fields which are geometrically defined along the manifold. Well, this was really started with the work of Christo de Lukanyman in the global Tonya Sabino Minkowski space time. They set up you know, a formalism that has been used many times and has now become very extremely you know, popular. Uh, and uh, the moment you don't use coordinates, you use frames, so what you can also use is that the Einstein, the Einstein equation is equivalent to the, uh, is equivalent to the Bianchi identities applied to the Riemann curvature. So uh, this, is, uh, this is what is used um, in, uh, in the proof, because so the, the, way, the way the formalism goes is that you have you use it up a uh, three plus one dimensional lens and manifold solutions to the Einstein equation. Let's see that this is covariant derivative. And then you assume that this metric, the, that this, this manifold, can be foliated by two surfaces. And to each point of, of the manifold, you associate a null frame, E3, E4, and EA. So you see E3 and E4 are null vectors. So you see that their norm is equal to zero and they're normalized so that you know, their dot product is minus two. And then you pick up some vectors which are tangent to the spheres and are orthogonal to your E3 and E4. And now in, in, you, can, you can denote the nabla, nabla three and nabla four, the projection of the space time covariant derivatives to the spheres. And so once you do that, once you have these null frames and you, you keep these this tangent vectors to the spheres, you can project all the geometric quantities that you have, so your Ricci coefficient, bulk curvature, electromagnetic tensor, everything, uh, you can project them on the spheres. And you get a bunch of, uh, of definitions. Like for example, as a, for a Ricci coefficient, you, you can 
project, you can take the covariant derivative with respect of, of, of the vector E4, of the null direction E4, along some tangent vector EA, and then uh, dotted with the EB, at least what is called the chi AB. And you can observe that this, um, when you have the surfaces, this is, is nothing else than the second fundamental form of the embedding of the sphere into the into the into the manifold uh, along the null direction in four, and similarly for it for the white curvature, you can take the white curvature and project it to you know some uh, tangent vector C A B and then the null vector C four A four, and this this is the, this defines the alpha, and the same for alpha bar. The electromagnetic tensor, same thing, you can project uh, the, your electromagnetic tensor or using these null frames, and then so you have all these geometric quantities. And now you have your Einstein equation written in as a as a um, uh, as Bianchi identities, and you can also project them to the spheres and obtain tensorial equations on the spheres. Okay, so the problem here is that yeah, of course you get many many of these equations, and one can really argue too many. <laughs> and it's you know this is normally the moment where you know in a talk on general and general relativity, people like you know start losing completely. You know the the you know the audience has never seen this these equations before because it's there's so many you know Greek letters and so many equations that it's really hard to even uh, uh, you know, keep up with this with you know, with with so many equations. I know that they seem to be all in low and they are all coupled together and all uh, just um, it, it's a whole mess. Okay, so uh, one may really wonder why. Why we're doing this? Why couldn't we just start? We, we just stick with the with the card with those wave coordinates that worked uh, well enough. So why are we doing this this method using this this null frames? Well, there is a very good reason, and the good reason is that the Kerr-Newman family admits a special null frame that is called the principal null frames, which diagonalizes the bulk curvature. So this means that if you you can write it down explicitly, let's say this e three and e four. You see here, but okay, it doesn't matter now. You know what are the what is the definition? But it's, it's just that if you write down these two e three and e four, then these two vectors not only are null and they they so that they 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 form an null frame and so on, but they diagonalize the white curvature. So if using these these frames, most of the of of the curvature components are zero except for these two components here. So this means that if you use this principal null frame, then you're linearizing. So let's say you want to linearize the Einstein equation, then you're linearizing around zero for most of the components. So it's very convenient to write the too many equations, for sure too many. But with respect to this principal null frame, they simplify dramatically. And in fact, they even become tractable. So more precisely, more precisely in vacuum, the symmetric two tensor on the spheres, so those alpha and alpha bar, so that are these components of the bulk curvature, um, in this side, this component of the right curvature, they satisfy a second order PE, which is wave like and decouples from all other components of the linearization. And this is what is called the Tokolsky equation. And this was found in 1972 by Tokolsky. And the structure of the Tokolsky equation is the following. So I'm going to denote it by this. Uh, this T is not cap T, and it's a down version operator applied to the this curvature component. Then a bunch of first order terms, so you see the first order term in the R, the T, and the phi, and then a potential for the for the um, multiplied by the, this, this component alpha. And in the physics, just as a remark, in the physics community, this Tukowski equation is, is, is expressed in terms of a complex scalar of spin plus and minus two, or spin, if for gravitational perturbations of spin plus and minus one, for electromagnetic perturbations can be written explicitly in this form. So you can write explicitly, you see the dependence on the dr, d theta, and the uh, sorry, the dr, d phi, and the t, and the potential. And uh, of course, in the framework of more stability, one considers solutions that are separated, solutions of this equation which are separated. Um, and so this is just I see, as a, as a remark. But if we don't want to look at the mode stability, but if we actually want to look at the general solutions to the Tukowski equation, well, how, how do we do it? Can we do, can we study general solutions of this equation? Well, unfortunately, no. Uh, and let's see why. Well, if you remember how you, you get uh, boundedness of the energy for just the, let's say the standard wave equation in Minkowski space. Let's say you have the inversion of Minkowski space is equal to zero. How do you obtain a process of conservation of the energy? You multiply by dt psi and you integrate by parts. 
If you do that, let's say even in 1D, right, you write down this is your wave operator, multiplied by dt, you integrate by parts here in dx, you create boundary terms, and you write the rest as a dt of uh, the sum of some energy density that is positive definite. And this gives the conservation of one integration, this gives conservation of the energy. And it's similar, similarly, for an, uh, if you had an equation of the form of the inversion minus a positive potential, and I'm going to call this kind of equations a Reggie Wheeler equation, because that they come up, they, they were found by Reggie Wheeler in the metric perturbation of Schwarzschild. Uh, if, you, if you had something like that, you could do the same. You could multiply by dt, integrate by parts. Since you have a positive potential, you actually obtain a conservation of, again, a positive coercive, a coercive uh, energy density. But if you have a Tokowski equation, so there is some the form of the inversion minus a potential, but then you have a, 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 a bunch of first order terms. The R d defined the t, you multiply by the t, you want to integrate by parts. Well, there is no integration by parts that would do the trick of, of give you some boundedness of the energy. So one cannot really obtain directly boundedness. And this issue already appears in Schwarzschild, where in fact one would like to pass. From a Tchaikovsky equation that contains this down version and potential, but also a bunch of first order terms into, so one would like to transform this equation into an equation that only contains a down version and a positive potential. So into from a Tchaikovsky equation into a Reggie equation. And in fact, there is such a transformation, and it's called now it's called Chandra Sekar transformation because it was introduced by Chandra Sekar in mode stability. But the firm was also only asked to do the physical space version for the first time uh, in Schwarzschild. Which allows to prove boundedness for the solution to the cost equation passing to a Reggie equation. And what is this transformation? What does this transformation do? Well, this transformation consists in taking two null derivatives of your quantity alpha. So, in a certain sense, it's a very, it is a crazy thing to do. I mean, you're taking a bad equation and you're taking two derivatives of a bad equation and hoping that you get a good equation. Well, so it's something that in general, seems pretty absurd that it would work. And in fact, I mean, the reason it works is that there is some hidden relations, relations between these two equations. In fact, the Tukovsky equation describes the perturbations at the level of curvature, while the Reggie Wheeler equation describes the perturbation at the level of the metric in Schwarzschild. And so this, uh, somehow, this taking two derivatives is going back from the curvature to the metric. And uh, once you, but you see, for some good rescaling of these two derivatives, there, there is such a transformation. You can actually transform the Tchaikovsky equation to Reggie Wheeler. And then once you have a Reggie Wheeler equation, you can apply the vector field method and all the, all the uh, uh, you know, methods that we, we know to study the wave equation, they pretty much work in this case uh, to obtain boundaries for general solutions of this Q. And then from the definition of Q, you can then deduce the, the same the same decay and boundedness for the, the curvature uh, component alpha. So this is in the case of Schwarzschild. Now, what about the case of Kerr? Well, there is a crucial difference between Kerr, Porter Newman, and Minkowski Schwarzschild. Is that this principal null frame? So this beautiful null frame that uh, where the, the diagonalizes the curvature. Well, this is not integrable in Frobenius sense. So, according to Frobenius theorem, and what Frobenius uh, what Frobenius sense means is that it means that the subspace of the tangent space, which is orthogonal to the any four. So, if you have this principal null frame, you look at the tangent space um, orthogonal to that. Well, this um, this this the this tangent the, the orthogonal in the tangent space is not tangent to a surface. So, it's not integrable. So, the, this surface is really not there. So the, the surface doesn't close, if you want. So this is a actually horizontal distribution of a two-plane field. So in particular, you remember that the chi was a second, I said, was a second fundamental form of the bedding of the sphere on the, in, the, in the manifold, but actually there's no sphere. And the way this, this um, gets encoded in the in this in the sky is that chi is not symmetric anymore. So, but now it's instead an anti-symmetric part that we denote h is chi. And so this is um, this is in the in the formalism that uh, I have with with Feynman and Schiftel, uh, in the perturbation or in the perturbations of Kerr. And because of, of this of this property of not being integrable and having all these anti-symmetric parts of most components, it is convenient it is convenient to actually complexify all the curvature and energy coefficients and consider, for example, here. The trace chi to be the real part and a trace chi to be the imaginary part 
of, um, of the trace of this complexified tensor. And if one does that, then the complexified perversion component uh, still, of course, satisfies the Tokolsky equation. So you have this, this kind of structure, the inversion plus a bunch of first order terms plus a potential equal to zero. And uh, in fact, this uh, in this case, in Kerr, it gets also transformed to a Chandra Sekar, to a Chandra Sekar transformation. This was done by Ma and by the famous Olsen Zeroniansky in the linear, uh, in the in the linear picture. Uh, in the linearized picture, and uh, again in this uh, work with Karina Sheftel uh, myself in the nonlinear case, um, we have uh, so what what the way the way uh, the transformation uh, goes is pretty similar to the case of, of Schwarzschild. It's just a bit more complicated. It still consists of two derivatives, uh, two uh, now derivatives of this curvature component A, and if you do that in the right way with the right scaling, this gives you. A generalized regime equation. So now it's not as simple as the case of Schwarzschild, where you had the Dalam version minus a potential Q equal to zero. You now have a first order term of this type, some uh, I real function equals n theta over rho square, nabla t derivative, and then a bunch of uh, terms involving up to two derivatives of the metric A, which uh, can be uh, considered as some lower term. Uh, at, at, you know, at first approximation, and here this this is a positive real potential, so that's uh, that's good. And uh, so this this is now the new equation that you have. You may really worry about this term because if you remember the problem in, in Tokolsky, the Tokolsky equation was really that you had the first order term, this nabla, this 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 um, nabla t. I mean, this this bunch of first order term were were the issue that would exactly did not would, would not allow you to study this equation in. Uh, in general. And so you may worry about this first order term, but in fact, the left hand side, so this, 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 um, the left hand side of this equation still has good divergent property as for the red Euler equation, where the left hand side can be treated as lower order terms for small angular momentum. And so this is actually good enough, and I'm going to show you uh, now why. So let's say we want to derive energy estimates for an equation of this form, where we have this type of first order term and some lower order term. Then uh, here, so, so these are now complex, uh, complex tensors. Uh, to do the energy estimates, we want to multiply by nabla t q bar, so the, the complex conjugate, and take the real part. And you see that if you do that, the first order term gets canceled out because of the structure that is given by i times a real function nabla t. Oops, sorry. Uh, then uh, you see that in doing that, in multiplying by the q, by the nabla t of q bar and taking the real part, this precisely gets cancelled. While the this this part here in the lower terms can be absorbed for very small angular momentum using the Morawitz bulk. Okay, now I finally want uh, when I get to the uh, case of gravitational and electromagnetic radiation. So the case of Einstein Maxwell equation. After uh, we talked about what happens in Schwarzschild and Kerr, let's see now what happens in Einstein Armstrong and Kerr Newman. So, uh, of course, remember that the Einstein Maxwell equation now governs the interaction between the gravitational radiation and the electromagnetic radiation. So, now from now on, the gravitational radiation is going to be red and the electromagnetic radiation is going to be blue. And uh, you see the gravitational radiation. Uh, is encoding the left hand side of the equation. As, and as we know from Kerr and Schwarzschild, well, it's transported by the Weyl curvature, was extreme null component. Alpha is a two tensor on the horizontal structure. While on the uh, right hand side, we have the electromagnetic radiation that is transported by the electromagnetic tensor, which is a two form, was extreme null component. Now, this beta f is a one tensor on the horizontal structure. Okay. And so what we know, again, back from, from Tokolsky, is that the gravitational and electromagnetic fields, when taken independently, that satisfy the Tokolsky equation of spin S. So the Tokolsky equation of spin S equals S plus and minus 2 for the gravitational radiation, S plus and minus 1 for the electromagnetic radiation. But this is not what we're doing here now. We're not taking those fields independently. We are taking a couple of electromagnetic gravitational perturbations. So in that case, there is going to be some interaction between the gravitational and electromagnetic so instead of having two independent Tukowski equations, one would really expect to have equations which couple the two tensor alpha with the one tensor beta, some one tensor beta f. And then when you, one would expect to have something like the Tukowski equation for alpha is sourced by, so it has to be sourced by the 
the beta, but now this the cost equation for alpha is a two tensor, so it cannot be simply sourced by the beta. It has to be sourced by the beta uh, with an operator, by an operator applied to the beta that transforms the beta into a two tensor. And such an operator would be, for example, this uh, nabla hop um, that is a, is a symmetric angular derivative. And similarly, the Tokoski equation for beta, now it's a Tokoski equation for one tensor. We expect it to be sourced by the alpha, which is a two tensor. So it has to be, for example, a divergence of alpha. The divergence would give, uh, will, will make an alpha a one tensor that will be able to source this kind of, will to be source this, this system. But things are not quite that simple. In fact, here, this is the first moment where we find a problem with the gauge. Because in a charge black hole, so when you have Q is different from zero, so the charge is different from zero, the, the, then the one tensor beta F is not gauge invariant. So what do I mean by gauge invariant? Well, remember we had this frame, this null frame E3 and E4 uh, defined uh, and just you know, as, a, as null frames was, was the uh, was the dot product was equal to minus two and which were orthogonal to uh, whatever was tangent to this horizontal structure. But of course, there is no, there is just not one special in the perturbation, there is not one special not frame. You can move uh, your E3 and E4 into E3 prime, E4 prime. And there is, you can actually write down, I mean, this is some sort of linear algebra, you can write down a uh, general linear frame transformation that transforms any E3, E4 in A into a new E3 prime, E4 prime, E4 prime, uh, depending on some parameters that are, you know, that are uh, small perturbations, uh, some O epsilon. Okay, so you can you can think in linear theory that you can perturb over no epsilon your your null frame, and then uh, and this you can totally you're totally allowed to do. This is a tensorial equation. You can this is a way of changing coordinates in a certain sense. But then uh, a tensor. So we say that a tensor is gauge invariant or quadratically gauge invariant if when you do this transformation, well, it only changes quadratically with the linear frame transformation. So if you change your your, your frame by an epsilon, this quantity is only going to change by an epsilon square. So in a certain sense, this is really, it does not depend on the coordinates. In linear theory, you don't see this, you don't see the O epsilon square. So in, in linear theory, this is an object that doesn't, uh, doesn't change uh, with, with the change of frame. And why do we care about this? Well, because of course, we are we're kind of we're trying to describe you know, waves or trying to describe radiation, like uh, gravitational radiation, electromagnetic radiation, and those who, who satisfy the some sort of Tokoski equation have need to have some um, physical interpretation. And something that is very dependent on the coordinates is not uh, is not good, is not good to describe. You know, the, the radiation that has to be something that doesn't depend on coordinates. It's, it's, it has to be like a radiation that is physical. And so this quantity beta f is not not gauge invariant. It's not good enough. And alpha is still gauge invariant for such um, black holes, but it's not as useful anymore. And in fact, what, what I did is to define new gravitational electromagnetic radiation. So now a new two tensor F and a one tensor B. And now, okay, if you know the notations, you can look at the definitions, but otherwise don't, don't worry about that. The only thing you may, you may uh, look at is that those are all, they're all you know, depending on uh, curvature and electromagnetic uh, tensor. So they're all coupled together. And uh, those two are now gauge invariant and they are related to the wide curvature by a certain relation given here. And of course, one may ask, okay, but why, which one is a gravitational, which one is electromagnetic? Well, it's like asking, you know, in this, in this picture, we have, you know, interactional waves, uh, the wave that is here, does it come from this one or does it come from, from this one? Well, it, there is, it, there, those two radiations are just uh, interconnected uh, from, from the beginning. I mean, this is just, it's just our, our interpretation of writing the Einstein Maxwell equation as a right hand side equal to a left hand side. But otherwise, those are coupled radiations. There's no way of actually identifying one as being gravitational, one as being electromagnetic. In fact, you can see in this system, they're just all coupled together. The, the thing that matters is that you're looking at some gauge invariant quantity. So each one of them is some sort of physical observables, but you cannot simply say which one is gravitational, and which one is electromagnetic. And as a consequence of the Einstein-Maxwell equation now, what we have is that this B satisfies the Tukoski type equation coupled with F, 
and the F satisfies the Tchaikovsky type equation coupled with B. So precisely what you would expect. So once you find the right quantities, the right gauge variant quantities, they behave in the way you expect, having this coupled uh, to system of Tchaikovsky equation. And as I remark, uh, what is in, uh, from a you know, physics, a physics um, perspective, now you have to modify a little bit in the case of Kerr Newman, the Tchaikovsky equations, because now they do not only depend on the spin type. So if you remember in the Tchaikovsky equation, it was, there was the S that was appearing and then multiplying everywhere. Uh, here, they also depend on something that is called the conformal type. So how these quantities change upon a rescaling of the E3 and E4 directions only. So taking an E3 into, into lambda E3 and an E4 into lambda minus one E4, how they change through that. So now this, these three quantities have different spin and conformal type and they satisfy slightly different equations because of that. So just as a remark. And so we have the system of the cost equation. We still have the same problem. This cannot be analyzed in, uh, in, in, uh, in physical space. It cannot be analyzed directly for general solutions. And we have to apply a chandra Sagar transformation. And uh, uh, remarkably enough, this chandra Sagar transformation exists in this case as well. It is a bit different than in the case of Rice, uh, in the case of Schwarzschild and Kerr, because it only consists on taking only one derivative in the null direction. And that's because these quantities are conformal. They have conformal. Uh, um, uh, they have uh, conformal type one. And but once you apply this from the second transformation, P and Q, then now these quantities P and Q satisfy a symmetric system of Reggie-Wheeler equation in Lyapunov space-time and generalized Reggie-Wheeler equation in Kerr-Newman space space-time. So let's see what happens in Rice and Nordstrom. Those quantities, which represent electromagnetic gravitational radiation, they satisfy the following system. So you see, if the left hand side is a nice uh, Reggie Wheeler equation with positive potential. And on the right hand side is precisely sourced. So you see, you have this symmetry. Uh, the right hand side of the equation for P is sourced by Q. The right hand side of the equation for Q is sourced by P. But and not in a, any way, in, you know, in a just random way, but it's in a symmetric way because the respective red and sign are joint operators on the spheres, meaning that you can integrate by parts using these two operators uh, in, in the sphere. So, and let's see uh, how this helps for the energy estimates. So if you, if you look at this coupling term, you can think of this as being, you know, they're coupling, so they're sourcing, they're both sourcing at the same time, not the equation for the other quantity. And if we try to do the energy estimate, so what would, what would we do? We multiply the first equation by nabla t of t and multiply the second equation by nabla t of q. Now the, the left hand side is just like the Reggie Wheeler equation as before. So that's that's fine. We can get boundaries of the energy. Now, what about the right hand side here? We cannot simply look at each of them separately because they will just not, there's no way we can control for the equation for p this q term. But what we can do, we can sum these two estimates. And if we sum these two estimates, then now we have the sum of these two terms. And now we can integrate by parts in t. And if we do that, we, uh, we have this nabla t that falls now on the q. We can commute the nabla t with the divergence. Now you see here, we precisely created this, these two terms. These two terms appearing here are precisely uh, the ones that cancel out according to the relation uh, given by this adjoint operators on the sphere, the divergence and the nabla hat are adjoint operators on the sphere. So upon integration of the spheres, this uh, this operation will give me some boundary terms that you know can be shown that you, you can show that these boundary terms actually uh, create a positive uh, definite energy. And this trick uh, uh, is actually equivalent to the fact that the system uh, uh, assume uh, uh, admits sorry admits a combined energy momentum tensor for the system. So if you define the energy momentum tensor as the sum of the energy momentum tensor for the equation for p plus the equation for q, which is defined in this way, in the standard way for a wave equation with a potential, and then you you correct it with this term, with this symmetric term here in p and q then uh, this, uh, the system is satisfied uh, if the divergence of this combined energy momentum tensor is equal to zero. 
And now, now that you have a combined energy method for the system, you can just apply the vector field method to that to obtain energy estimates if you use x equal dt and Morawitz estimates if you use x equal f of r dr with f, a function that you know vanishes at the photosphere. And uh, you can uh, you can do that uh, you know by defining this f in a in different way in different regions, but um, this allows you to prove uh, more. Uh, energy estimates and more of its estimates for this system. And now let me, I'm going to conclude by saying just a few words about the case of Kerr-Newman. So if you remember, uh, when I said when I said the results about the mode stability, uh, I mentioned that there was no mode stability result for Kerr-Newman. And in fact, if we go uh, back to this book by Chandra Sagar, it was published in 1983, a mathematical zero black holes, so, and we go to you know basically at the end of the book, just to the first few pages, I think like the four pages that you know Chandra Sekar uh, leaves for Ker Newman. He says he writes the methods have been proved to be so successful in treating the gravitational perturbations of Kerr do not seem to be applicable for treating the couple of electromagnetic gravitational perturbations of Kerr-Newman. The principle of Oster will find separated equations. Now we should briefly consider the origin of this apparent insolubility of coupling between spin one and spin two fields in the perturbed space time. And so what he does is like starts deriving the Tchaikovsky equation just like we were just doing in Kerr and so on, and it goes on. And then you see just two pages, and at the end, at the end of the page, if we zoom in, he says all efforts to decouple these equations were not successful, nor as other alternative manipulations of the systems were equally unsuccessful. So what goes wrong in Kerr-Newman? What happens in Kerr-Newman that is so, so much worse than Kerr, for example? Well, remember, here we're talking about mode stability analysis. So we're talking about lo looking at separated solutions, so solutions of the separated forms. And when you separate the solutions in this form and you plug it into the Tchaikovsky equation, this gives you a, an angular OD for S, which those are the definitions. This, that's what defines the spin as weighted spheroidal harmonics, the eigenfunction of certain Laplace. And if A is equal to zero, so if there's no rotation, then those reduce to the spherical harmonics. And if you're looking at spherical harmonics, then uh, and if you apply those operators that appear on this Tchaikovsky equation, so remember this divergence and this double hat, they commute very nicely with the spherical harmonics, meaning that if you apply this operator to a spherical harmonic of, of for one tensor, then this is proportional to the spherical harmonic of for two tensors, and similarly for the divergence. So this is nothing else than the odd the odd theory on the sphere. And in, on the other hand, if you're in the general axis in magic case, if you have if you have the actual spheroidal harmonics, then those are the, those spheroidal harmonics with different spins are not simply related. And so you may see where the problem is coming from, because in the in the case of let's say rice and nostrum, you may have a system of couple to cost equation, but when you separate in spherical harmonics because you're in spherical symmetry. Then uh, he, this you have this sort of uh, this sort of uh, decomposition in the spherical harmonics that somehow through this operator uh, divergence of the spherical harmonic of spin two gives you something that is proportional to the spherical harmonic of spin one or for one tensor and the same for the second equation so it, it gives you just one equation for the spherical harmonic of, of of for one tensor and one for the two tensors so that it gets the the, the composition passes through. If you are in care, well, you, you're, you're using the spheroidal harmonics, but you're only using the one of spin two. You're only using the one for two tensors because you don't have electromagnetic radiation. So there's, this problem just does not arise. But in Ken Newman, you now have the interaction. So you have the coupled system. Uh, so you have the, the, spher the spheroidal harmonic of spin one is the spheroidal harmonic of spin two. But now this operator does not pass this through uh, anymore. So you cannot write this in terms of the spheroidal harmonic of spin one. And the same for the second equation. So these two equations just do not decouple. So really, in this case, the mode decomposition is not your friend. So for this perturbation, electromagnetic gravitational perturbations of Kerr-Newman, the decomposition in modes, which was very understandably done to simplify the analysis of the equations back then, well, actually makes them unsolvable. And so our approach to solve these issues is really to just abandon completely the decomposition in modes and perform a physical space analysis, of course, by taking advantage of the, you know, progress, tremendous progress in the analysis of wave rotation that, you know, it was, that was um, obtained in the last 15 years. And if one can prove that the general solution is bounded through physical space analysis, then in particular, we imply the absence of exponentially growing modes, so therefore, most of it, so we imply a stronger result. 
and that's what we have in the Kermuma. So uh, uh, the two quantities, the two Chandra Sagar transform quantity P and Q, so it's fine now generalized the Julian equation. But you see, you have, I mean, right here, so the, the left hand side is still this first order term, which is not, which is, uh, not a problem, just like in K. And now the coupling term is a bit more complicated than Rice and Nostrum, but it actually, so it has this, these additional order terms, but it actually, the, the important thing is that the system is still symmetric. Now this right hand side, even though are more complicated, but the interaction between these functions here and these order terms uh, are such that these right hand side are adjoint operators. Now, not with respect to integration of the spheres, because remember, there's no sphere anymore in Kerr or Kerr Newman. Uh, what you have is now that those are symmetric with respect to the space time interval. So if you integrate instead of the full space time, which is what you're going to do at the end of the day to get your estimates, now these are adjoint operators. And so let me yeah, maybe very briefly try to you know, describe how then you get these estimates. Again, it's the usual story. We're multiplied by number t. Uh, of, of p bar, the first equation, by number two q bar, the second equation. Uh, and uh, again, as, as in care, this first order term gets cancelled, the order term can be absorbed by Morawitz. And now for the coupling terms here, just as in Mackie and Nostrum, we sum the two equations. Now here there's lots of calculations, and I'm just going to uh, say what happens if you integrate in dt, in the, in the by part in dt, now the interaction between, as I said, this function, this this angular function, this function uh, uh, outside of the, of the of your right hand side, and this order term, is precisely such that uh, in doing this integration by parts, so in, just like what you would do in Rice and Nordstrom, you would integrate on the sphere. Now here you need to integrate instead on the full space time, and if you are careful to do that, then you get the cancellation precisely the cancellation you want. And you're left with only boundary terms of the form dt plus the space-time divergence. And so this, you can use this, again, these boundary terms to prove that they give you a coercive energy, at least for small angular momentum, to prove that this, this is now, you can analyze this, uh, this system. And now, again, I guess I uh, ran out of time. I just maybe going to mention that you can uh, then analyze this system in physical space through the Carter tensor. And uh, the Carter tensor is, is uh, you know, this additional healing uh, tensor that one has in addition to the healing vector fields in the case of Kerr. And um, that satisfies you see, this, uh, this um, uh, healing equation. And um, the, the only thing you have to be careful is that, you know, if you write down, on this, it can be written down explicitly the Carter tensor in care in, in this way as a minus a squared plus a squared theta, the metric plus the angular, this angular components here. And associated to that, you can define a second order differential operator given by the, this, this uh, something that is proportional to the Laplace, to the, sorry, to the, to the inversion plus this modified Laplacian. Uh, and now uh, the problem you may think of is that there is this fact that says in vacuum space time, the second order differential operator associated with the tensor commutes with the Dalam version. And so you can use this Laplacian as a symmetry operator in addition to the, to the dt square, dt phi, and d phi square to uh, obtain more of its estimates. This is as it was obtained by Anderson Blue in 2015. But in the case of Kerr Newman, now uh, K in general fails to compute to the inversion operator because this is not vacuum anymore. And in fact, if you compute the if you compute the, the commutator between K and the inversion, you actually get a bunch of terms that depend on the Ricci curvature. But what is extremely what is remarkable is that even if you have a, just a general solution, yes, the Maxwell equation, this doesn't cancel out in general. But in the case of Kerr Newman, a, looking at precisely what are the values of your, the Carter tensor and the Ricci curvature in the case of Kerr Newman, it actually turns out that this commutator is equal to zero. So you can apply, you can extend the, the, uh, the, uh, the, car, the, the use of the Carter tensor uh, to obtain you know, Morawitz estimates in physical space in the case of Kerr Newman, uh, precisely using, uh, using this, this property. And with this, I get to my conclusions. Uh, where I uh, summarized that, you know, in order to overcome the issue of indissolubility of coupling between spin one and spin two field for the for this general, the most general perturbation of black hole you can think of, so electromagnetic gravitational perturbations of Kerr Newman, we derive non separated equations, analyze them in physical space, and those equations are, are given by a couple, couple system on generalized Reggie Wheeler, 
that are obtained from the Tukovsk equation to the Chandra cycle transformation, which crucially have the same property as in care in the left hand side, so real potentials and first order term of the form IDT, and the same property as Rice and Nostrum on the right hand side, so having this, this adjoint coupling terms. And the decompositional modes, in fact, prevented to see this good structure of the equations. But on the other hand, doing a physical space analysis gives stronger results and stability by proving boundaries of the energy and space time energy decay estimates. And with this, I conclude. Thank you for your attention. All right. All right. All right. Thank, thank, let, let's thank Dr. Georgi for uh, this wonderful talk. And uh, I guess it's time to take uh, questions. So if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and ask. Uh, hello, Elena. So this is Surya. Hi. Hi. I um, have some questions. So first, I think in, in the slide 28, you have a definition of conformant type. Uh, I think it's denoted by C. What, what, what is the conformant type? Okay, let me, let me go back. So you say 28, so let's see. Okay, yes, yeah, so let me, uh, maybe I'll go back to here to see what's the definition. So you see, if you look at uh, this ah, okay. uh, E4, right? So uh, they, yeah. uh, they, if you change E4, you just will consider the lambda. You take E4 prime goes to lambda E4 and E3 prime goes to lambda minus one E3. Then you can uh, just do, just looking at this, at this uh, conformal transformation. Then ah, okay. you can look at how, how each, each of the component changes. To so, so if you translate it into uh, newman Penrose language, it's like the boost weight. Exactly, yes. And the other is the spin weight. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, a second question is about the, um, the alpha in the current Newman. So you say something like uh, the alpha is not good. I mean, the equation uh, yeah. of alpha is not good. Uh, what's the uh, reason? So, I, I mean, it's it's not, yeah, it's not as useful anymore. I mean, it's just it's just more complicated. So basically what you have is that your equation for alpha, the alpha is a mm -hmm. source by like some first derivatives or some like uh, number four. So like some non-derivatives of the F and a bunch of other things. And so, yep. um, and so what you have is basically, you have a system of, or you have a system of three equations, which are, for three quantities which are related by this relation. So really one of these three equations is, is, is not necessary. Like, I mean, one of these three equations is um, uh, redundant. And uh, I choose to take uh, the, the one for alpha to be redundant because it's, it's the most complicated one. It's the one where if you apply the chandra segraph transformation, you, you pick up, uh, for, first of all, the chandra segraph transformation is more complicated for alpha because you have to uh, commute twice with the, with the E3. Mm -hmm. instead of one. Uh, and then if you do that, then you have on the right hand side the Laplacian for F, so something that uh, like second order, second order derivative for F. When if you start with F and B, you only have to take two derivatives, right? So you only take one mm -hmm. and three, and you only have yeah. one derivative of the Q and the P on the right hand side. And as but this is somehow equivalent, right? Because like the definition of B, it's like uh... More or less, it's like E three derivative acting on alpha, but yes, it takes the exactly. uh, yes. inverse. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it, it is equivalent. I mean, of course, so you have you have a system of three equations and a relation. A system of three equations for three quantities which are related by a relation. So uh, the, it's a, uh, this is a system you can you, it's redundant. I mean, you, there is one equation that is redundant. The only one you really don't want to throw away. The the, the, the one you you cannot say it's redundant is the equation for B. So this is the equation for this quantity P, because B is the is only the only one that is a one tensor. So this is giving mm -hmm. you information about the spin one, about, sorry, about the L equal one mode. So the yeah. other two, the other two will only give you a better equal than two. So um, this one you don't want to throw it away, but for between F and alpha, you could choose. And I, I, I just it just choose the one that looks uh, nicer because especially from the from the the, the the intuition and the experience I had with Rice and Nordstrom, that really in Rice and Nordstrom, the equations for P and Q are just a bit simple. So there's nothing else, there's nothing else in this in this in the system for in the system of equations for P and Q. And so it's just easier to look at the at the transform for the BNF. And so the, because of this intuition, I mean as it can you mind just kind of start with the same two equations. But of course, yeah, you could in principle uh, do it with, with alpha, uh, but I, I think it would be just more complicated. Okay, because I, I think I saw the, the Tokoski equation of alpha and uh, this beta f, 
I think they're also, uh, I mean, on the right hand side, they're also like a symmetric hyperbolic or a joint. Somehow uh, it's it's the same structure, right? You have divergence and uh, yes. this lambda whole, lambda. Yes, but as I said, the yeah, divergence for, I mean, the equations for alpha will have the first, yeah, the first, like some lambda four derivative of f on the right hand side. So you have also to consider the equation for f. Uh, it's okay. okay. Yeah, you, but you could do it, of course. You, you could, it's, I mean, again, it's, it's all equivalent. It's just uh, so there is a way to do it also using, using alpha. It's just a, uh, it, it doesn't seem natural to do it because it seems that you're really keeping the most complicated equation. The equation that looks the most complicated, so. Okay, I see. Um, so finally, uh, so you say something about energy and Morawitz for Kerr Newman. So is this proved or you're describing the general strategy? So I'm describing the general strategy. It's not uh, proved okay. yet. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I just have the, uh, I, mean, I, I mean, I guess what's out in the, uh, it's, uh, it's just, you know, the, the how to get the equations and the sketch rate, how to get the energy estimates. And the mm -hmm. way you get the morality estimates by applying, as I said, I mean, uh, I have one out is that how you can extend, just at the very last thing that I said, very, very fast, uh, how mm -hmm. you can extend the Anderson Blue um, uh, method to the case mm -hmm. of Einstein Maxwell equations, so to the case of uh, non vacuum, so that you, you can still do that in, in the, the, the modified Laplace still commutes. Uh, with yep. the number. Yep. And, uh, and this is something that, so that I have in the, in, as an application for, you know, just for the standard wave equation and, you know, again, as a, as a sketch in the system. But uh, the full, uh, the, the full uh, thing is not uh, uh, like uh, written down yet. It's also going to be uh, kind of, uh, so parts of it, uh, even, even in care, right, it's not, it's not done. It's it's what we're doing, and uh, you know, hopefully it's gonna be it's gonna be uh, out soon. Okay. Uh, in in the case of care, we we kind of much there. So they're basically using the Anderson blue method, so the physical space analysis using the tractor tensor applied to the general to generalize energy with uh, even in care. So then you have this order terms and so on. So basically, what you did in uh, what you did in uh, like for the linear care, but using the just physical space analysis because in that case it's it's more useful for in that case I mean we use that because it's uh, in, in non-linear theory that's the only thing that we we know how to do uh, okay yeah sure. and, and that mm -hmm. would be also applied to the case of kernel so i can I ask uh, so um so eventually this energy and morale estimate you you describe the are you expecting they're going to work for a small a small charge or also for some other cases uh, so this, I mean, for sure, for small small a, uh, especially because I mean we again we're relying on uh, I'm relying on this sure. on this Carter tensor approach, which only works for small a for, for mm -hmm. so. Um, and no, for the charge, I mean, uh, I don't expect it that has to be small because again, uh, since this, this can be, I mean, this this can be done, you know, for uh, the, in the full sub extreme arranger as an option. And so, in a certain sense, when you pass to per Newman, you really, you may want, you 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 can, you can adapt to most of these things. So, what you really need is a small angular momentum. You don't, you don't get that. But rest not strong is a bit different, right? So, also, you have decoupling, um, more or less like a symmetric hyperbolic system. No, no, no decoupling, sorry. Symmetric hyperbolic system, you can show energy and morale for this system, but uh, because a uh, rest not strong is uh, spheric symmetric, you, you can also do metric perturbation. You can also get like reg, reg Wheeler equation in that setting for the metric perturbations. So in some sense, it's, uh, it's expected that uh, Q, the charge Q does not play a role. I mean, you can do it for large Q and small Q. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference somehow for metric perturbation is not quite, um, I mean, it's leader. Uh, but for Kerr Newman, uh, I don't know. Um, it's like, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't quite see how this, uh, I mean, in Kerr Newman, uh, this, uh, for instance, if you have large Q, how do you get um, energy uh, and morality? I mean, but you see, you see in, uh, in the, so this, these are the precise in the Reggie Wheeler. So, so this is somehow, I mean, it, this transfer of transformation is relating to the metric, per, metric perturbations in, uh, yeah. in, in Reson And in, in Kerr Newman, I mean, it's uh, basically in doing the same thing, like this, these equations are now the one, if you want, you can interpret them as some sort of, 
uh, uh, the equations for the metric perturbations of Newman in a certain sense, even though, you know, of course, they do not decouple, and that's why, that's why you cannot do just metric perturbations in care of Newman. Uh, but so yes, that is, that's what you have. So, and then you, so now if you forget the you know, their metric perturbation, the perturbation perturbation, and so on. Now this is uh, for what you really need is, is that some the smallness of if you have had a equal to zero, this reduces to the one in lesser notion. Mm -hmm. A is mm -hmm. small, then uh, and, and you know you know all the things that are problematic in uh, in uh, oh, okay. passing from lesser notion to care are really much simpler if you take a very small. So let's see the trapping the Ergo region and so on. So uh, I don't see um, I, I, I don't see why you know the you cannot. Uh, okay, I get it. I yeah. think mm -hmm. as a, even as a continuity with a continuity argument in a, uh, if you if you have something that you know, is valid in the full sub extremal range uh, of Q, you you'll be able to uh, yeah pass uh, in, into the case of Newman as long as a is much smaller. Uh, in, in case A is, is much, is, 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 is very small, like over there. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, but I, I see your point that, you know, it's, it, it's not that obvious to see how uh, how that, you know, fits in the picture of, you know, magic perturbation in, in this case, since you don't have magic perturbation. Mm -hmm. in the game. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, it's a very impressive talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for your questions. Do you have more questions? You know, I guess I'll ask I'll ask a question. I guess uh, it's a pretty naive question, but uh, yeah. So your uh, this uh, you know the stress energy tensor you define for the this coupled wave equation, the the coupled uh, gravitational and the <coughs> electromagnetic sector. So this stress energy tensor is it like you know uh, how do you, how do you construct this? is it like purely by a kind of trial and error or like are those stress energy tensors somehow related to you know the the full uh, the Bell Robinson plus the electromagnetic stress energy tensor like some combination of those. So you're you're talking about um, this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stress energy tensor. Um, yeah, I mean. Uh, like yes, getting... I mean, again, the, yeah, they are really, but this is, I mean, it's a bit simple, yeah, just it's a simpler than that. It's a, it's really the, the energy momentum tensor for the first, um, so associated to just to a wave equation, uh, to a wave, a wave equation with a potential. So, and that's, um, right, right, yeah, right. Uh, for the first equation plus the second equation, then uh, you subtract this part. So, I guess, okay, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So, you're saying, you're asking if, so how, if this is uh, related to the like sort of like the Bell Robinson that's associated to the acting Maxwell equation, right? Uh, because like uh, physically, I would I would first think that like you know the stress energy tensor for coupled gravitation and electromagnetic tensor is somehow related to some you know, if not the full but certain component combination of certain components of the Bell Robinson plus the the stress energy tensor for that. Yeah, that's uh, that's a that's a good question and. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't, I, I don't see it like it, I don't see it like that. Obviously, just because you know there is a. I mean, passing from the Einstein. I mean, the the, the full Einstein Maxwell equations as you can write it at the beginning uh, to this. You know, there, there were lots of things that were happening. So, for example, these are the wave equations associated to the p and p and the p and the q, which are you know first so first derivative of a bunch of electromagnetic and curvature uh, components. So it's a bit. Uh, I mean, it may be, but it's it's just uh, it's 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 hard to it's hard to see uh, directly. But uh, right for, for sure. I mean, it, it, there is there is a relation because you know if if you have something that. As a property that is divergence, uh, that its divergence is equal to zero, if and only if your equations are satisfied, then it has to be there has to be somehow hidden um, the relation with the same is the same tensor that has a similar property. You know, it's divergence free somehow encodes the the validity of the equation. So um, it, it is probably related, but it's not. It's not clear, clear how. Right, right. Yeah. And this, this, like, you know, definition of this energy momentum tensor uh, seems very miraculous, like this uh, cancellation and everything. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean it's, you know, I mean it's, yeah, it's miraculous. But you know, again, it goes back, I guess, to what yeah, what C1 was saying that, you know, if you uh, in in Eisenstein, there is 
they, I mean, we, we knew already from like the most stability uh, results that there was uh, the coupling of those equations and the level of the metric perturbation. This is just, you know, a more refined, if you want, way of interpreting that. So having the fact that you can, you can, this decoupled system can actually be expressed as a, as a, as a symmetric system for which you can define a combined argument of time. So those are things are, are, uh, are all related uh, between them. But so, but okay, but so then in, uh, in this sense, so then uh, it's not as easy, uh, as easy then to relate it to the bad Robinson, because for example, the bad Robinson, I mean, th that those things you will have it also in Kern Newman, but in Kern Newman, you don't have such a nice decoupling. So this is somehow stronger, right? I mean, this having this combined argument of tensor for this system is stronger than having uh, just uh, having a better Robinson tensor associated to the Einstein Maxwell equation. So I would say that one probably one implies the other, but not they're not equivalent. Or... Right. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, can I ask another question? Like uh, uh, this one may be really nice question. So how do you, how do you like you know uh, uh, construct like a conserved energy? Uh, in, in a smooth way, like outside the, like for the rotating Carnivian case, like outside the argosphere and the inside the argosphere. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't really. Yeah, so how do, how do you construct, you know, a, a conserved energy for, uh, for in a continuous way, like, you know, outside the argosphere and inside the argosphere? Like, uh, so you, oh, you mean in, uh, so uh, I guess, okay, not that I, I simplified very much, you know, in the, in the, in the kind of computation, I only looked at dt, I mean, I just said, okay, let's multiply by dt, but of course, in, in care, you, you cannot just multiply yeah. by dt, yeah. because, because it is the average region, so, yeah. for example, for small, so small angular momentum, it's, uh, you know, there is a, there is a, uh, uh, an easy way, let's say, to fix this, you can, you can interpolate, um, the what is the like the Hawking vector field or the vector field like dt plus a over r squared plus a squared d phi. So right. this, this vector field is like a time like everywhere in the exterior. And so you can take and it's null at the horizon. So for very small a you can say that this vector field is time-like near the near the horizon in the Argos in the Argo region. And then you can interpolate this with the dt um, vector field that is the time like outside the Argo region. Right. So, Using this, you can you can um, you can get around uh, most of the things as long as you have some morality estimates to, to to absorb the the term the terms so that you know wherever you are interpolating it, this is not killing anymore. Uh, and so you have some terms appearing in the bulk of your computations when you take a divergence of your energy momentum tensor, and so and those will have to, can be absorbed for uh, again for 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 small a. Uh, when, as long as you have a Moravitz, a Moravitz uh, so this is this was done, for example, by Anderson Blue for uh, for for small angular momentum in care. So that's uh, I, of course I simplified very much in the in what I showed. I just uh, showed the t because again the if you're in small especially small a the most the most trouble term is the t just because it's the one that doesn't that that doesn't is not trapped at the at the trapping region. Um, and so that's, uh, but in general, you would have to do that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So thank you for your questions. Do you have any more questions? Like, please. Okay, if not, then uh, let's thank Dr. Giorgi once again. Uh, for this wonderful talk and uh, we'll see everyone uh, next week thank you